Hello. Hey there. Sorry, I, I was waiting in the in the Zoom room and I didn't realize you were in the Google room, so I apologize. Uh, it's okay. I, I find this stuff fiddly. Um, uh, yeah. Just so. Uh, thank you for speaking to me. Sure. Yeah. Um, I've got a few questions prepared. Um, so let me just find find uh, my list here. So. Yeah, uh, it, it, is it okay for me to uh, record this call? Because um, I'm sort of putting together a sort of documentary type thing, and I'll have yeah. like your voice in like sort of sound clips if that's okay. Yeah, it's fine. That's very that's very nice of you. It's just that um, I, I'm I know that you're in America, but like here, it was so difficult to find anybody that was a willing to speak to me that had some experience within uh, the neo-Nazi sort of organization who has been a part of that organization and was willing to come forward. Um, so do you know a bit about what I'm doing or do you need me to sort of explain that? I know a little bit. I looked at what you had said, but if you can give me a quick explanation, that'd be great. Yeah, um, so... Basically, I'm a YouTube auditor. Do you know what that is? Yep. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm a little bit less pushy than the other auditors, let's put it that way. I'm more kind of like I look at how the police interacts with sort of targeted groups and, you know, like minorities or minors or um, the homeless and in my city Manchester in England the police have become kind of like a very authoritarian sort of very fascist type um, authority figure and it's it's quite scary and it's quite uh, hard to live with that and so basically my role as an auditor is just to film these interactions and then post them on YouTube to sort of make the public aware of what is happening out there and to kind of put my own, um, you know, opinion in, in there as well and uh, to sort of analyse what what might potentially be going on. So um, I'm kind of putting together the, one of the next videos that I'm doing. I've been working on it for a few months now. Um, my suspicion is that... Um, the UK police force has become compromised by neo-Nazism. Um, one of the things that, that makes me feel this way is not just their behaviour and how they interact with targeted groups, but also... Um, have you heard of the Thin Blue Line badge? Yes. Yeah, a, a lot of the, the officers in my area are wearing that badge... Um, I've questioned about 20 to 30 officers about the badge. Um, they have 100% all been defensive of it, um, being worn on their police uniform. They've been very kind of uh, slightly... They, they kind of scoff at me when I even, you know, sort of say that there might be, um, like, even a little bit of bias in them having that badge on their uniform. Um they get very sort of, um, what's the right word? They become very standoffish, and they, um, I, th I would, I don't know how to describe it. It's, it feels like that they there is a deliberate use of that badge, and that there is there it because that it has connections with America and the Blue Lives Matter organization, and there is, you know, uh, connotations of white nationalism. Um, it it just it, it is very scary to to see a, a badge like that being worn on um, the majority of of police officers' uniforms, and the fact that they won't accept it, and that. You know, when I have even mentioned Nazism to them, 100% of the time, they don't even seem to be um, kind of concerned at all about that. They see Nazism as a political um, opinion. Um, did, were you able to watch uh, that, that video link that I sent uh -huh. to you? Yeah, it's, it's like they, they're not concerned about Nazism, and they're not concerned at how terrifying 
that movement can be, especially when it's represented on um, a public official, like a, a like a police person, it, because they have to be impartial, they have to be objective, and yeah. So uh, the 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 first question I have is, I know it's a bit late, and I've I've been rambling on and and stuff, but I just wanted to. Uh, ask you so would you like to introduce yourself and perhaps talk a bit about your occupation and your background um sure um so i'm pat rickards i'm the executive director of life after hate uh, which is a a us-based ngo uh, where we help individuals disengage from violent far-right extremist groups and online hate spaces and reintegrate into society hmm do you have do you have a lot of um, experience with neo Nazism in particular? I, it's when when you look at violent and far right extremism in the United States, most of it was rooted in neo Nazism. Um, yeah. I think you know you see you know particularly um, you know, it's you know whether, whether you want to call it violent far right extremism or or violent white supremacy, it is all the same thing. Um, you know, you see, you know, our, our, we as an organization were actually founded by individuals who were who were neo Nazis. Oh right, so they were they wanted to create um, somewhere that uh, they could go, where other ex neo Nazi members could go to sort of get away from that life. They did. I mean, they, they, our founders, you know, they themselves had gotten themselves out of the life for a whole host of reasons. Yeah. Uh, and a value in helping others like them see that there were options. You were not locked into a life of violent extremism for the rest of perpetuity. Mm. Yeah, it, it, I I don't know whether in in the UK there's that much um, like like prominence within the neo Nazi um, organization. That when when you tend to see neo Nazis in the UK, it'll be on like a, a a very quick news article and they'll be wearing balaclavas, they'll have their identities hidden. Um, uh, but in the US, I imagine it's a little bit more prominent. Is is that right? It is. I mean, I think that you, know, you still see a number of organizations that will try to hide their identities. Hmm. Uh, but, you know, what you've seen, particularly in recent years in the United States, uh, is when we're talking about the violent far right, they, they've been they've been far less likely to hide who they are. Yeah. Right? Um, mm. So so intersect. It used to be all about ideology. Now it's all about politics, uh, and so it's it, it, it's become so intersected that it becomes difficult to separate the two. Mm, it's become a lot. They've, I suppose, they've tried to normalize um, their their ideology. Is would that be fair to say? I don't know. If it's, I, I think that society has allowed us to normalize their ideology. Yeah. Uh, I think when you when you integrate it with the politics, uh, it becomes much much harder to condemn people who hold political views that are similar to thirty five percent of the country. Uh, and so you know, it, it's you know, it used to be these were things that we kept hidden. I think that because of politics and because of social media, we're far more willing uh, to be very public about our hate. Yeah. I, mean, I, I will often say, you know, at least here in the United States, I don't believe we've become more hateful as a society, but we certainly have become more tolerant in having it expressed in public. Mm. Uh, there's no longer a, a desire to keep it private. There's no longer any sorts of shame that comes with it. Mm. Uh, we are we are fine with it, with being very public about it now. Yeah, I, I think social media has definitely been um, the precursor for that because it's like you either uh, belong to one team or the other and you have to fit into that box as much as possible or you, you there's like no middle, middle ground. You have to be either one or the other and it's just created these two very, uh, ex you know, very extreme sort of ways of thinking. You're either fully right or you're fully left or nowhere yeah. in between are you allowed to to, to sit and th that is 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 that kind of what you're kind of like saying as well with that 
that that that has allowed you know the far right to kind of just sort of come into the mix and kind of um you know be very much under the radar is would that be fair and well i i think i think we we've definitely allowed the far right to become more mainstream mm. um, and, and as i said I mean, we've seen in the united states where it's so it's so cross-connected to what goes on in politics um but there is no question uh, that you know, and again, because we see this ideology connecting itself to politics, uh, you know, we we are very quick. We have people that run to the the poles of politics, and then you have the far left, and you have the far right. There is very little middle ground. There is very little desire to find a middle ground yeah. uh, where there is uh, is any any sort of moderation or at least a tolerance for the views of others. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I would. I would agree with, with that. Um, so uh, the the next question that I had, because we've kind of got already got, I touched on a few of the uh, questions I already had lined up. One of them was, "Are you aware of the Thin Blue Line badge?" And um, it, over here, I think that there was um, an article about um, UK officers being asked to remove the Thin Blue Line badge from their uniforms uh, because it had neo-Nazi connotations and they outright refused to do that. Um, and that is that kind of made my suspicions get a little bit more kind of like, if you... If you were told that, you know, something that you're wearing has very strong connections to the far right and white nationalism and neo-Nazism, you'd at least kind of be a little bit more wary about having it. But it, the, the, the UK police have kind of become very defensive of it and they just won't um, accept that it is wrong for them to be wearing it and it's it's a very scary thing does it has that sort of thing happened in the US are you aware of anything like that well, I think here in the United States I mean we definitely have seen the issues that uh, that you know we both the far left and the far right have had with the police uh, dating back to to issues like George Floyd and you saw you know a, a great number of people that have come to the defense of police, hmm. uh, you know, here, here in the United States, remember our, our response to black lives matter was blue lives matter. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that, that was definitely a, a concern. I can tell you, you know, we, we work with law enforcement. We've done training courses for law enforcement so that they understand violent far right extremism and how it intersects with their work and, and what it is they need to do to better understand those that they're going to engage with. And, you know, you do run, you know, one, one of the very real, uh, facts now is you do see individuals that you know I I would dub as 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 white nationalists or or you know, even neo Nazis and those sorts of things is they are ta they are driven um, with an interest in joining law enforcement or in joining the military yeah uh, so it's you, know, you have that natural intersection with those who may hold some harmful ideologies but may also seek to involve themselves in positions of authority mm. uh, because they believe that will put them in a place of power where they can uh, enact a world that, that more closely resembles what they're hoping for. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's the reality. I, I don't think the majority of, of law enforcement officers are like that. I think quite the opposite. Uh, but all you need is, is one bad actor. Uh, yeah. And that that can ruin not just not just how you're dealing with the communities, but you know completely destroys whatever trust uh, and faith your communities have in law enforcement. Yeah, that that was actually going to be my next question. In your line of work, is it common for extremists to seek out roles within the police in order to exploit their their position of power? And I think you've pretty much answered that. So. Um, in in the UK, the the standard for who they allow into the police force has dropped so drastically. Like you will see, like high school students, like seventeen year olds who you know were picked on in school, suddenly in the police force. You'll see people with uh, very serious physical ailments 
it, you know, wearing a police uniform like the standards, the vetting process is non-existent, and it probably has always been a thing of, you know, extremist look for that position of power to exploit, and unfortunately, it's like an open door within the UK police where anybody can get in without so much as you know a bat of an eyelid. It's just like, and um. A little bit about myself, I, I was racially harassed for about four years by my now ex-door neighbour, uh, ex-next-door neighbour, and um, that ended with about 150 to 200 reports to the police of racial harassment. A lot of that wasn't even like um, um, responded to by the police, a lot of it was brushed aside and... Um, ignored and I put in complaint after complaint about the police and another problem with it is not just that there is no vetting but there's no um, there's no uh, like there's no like their bosses don't tell them off so there's no um, responsibility um, they don't there's no um, what, what, what's the word that I'm looking for <laughs> Accountability, sorry. Mm -hmm. I had a brain fart then. Uh, there's no police accountability. There's no vetting process. Anybody can get into the police force. And that is, it has allowed the most extreme and the most depraved um, types of individuals to enter uh, the police. I mean, in my local newspaper, you'll hear, you'll read things like a hundred and a hundred and so many sex offenders have, uh, are being investigated by um, in the local police force and it's just like things of that, of that nature have just become norm and Nazism is, is quite terrifying because of the history of it and it isn't just a political ideology, it has it, 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 let me just I'll tell you a funny it's not really funny but it's quite dark um, I did speak to uh, one of the officers and and he I think at the time he, they, they were pretending to sort of be uh, looking for terrorists in, in my local sort of town centre and we were having a conversation about um, the, the the thin blue line badge and the fact that it has origins within neo-Nazism and they were brush, brushing it off like, oh, it doesn't matter, whatever. And suddenly I said, well, doesn't it, doesn't it bother you that, you know, this did that organisation had led to the deaths of six million Jewish people and he said whoa 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 we were having such a nice conversation about Nazism and then you bring up the Holocaust I mean you can't have one without the other right. <laughs> yeah it's well, I, I think I mean you, you raise some really important points and I, I think it's one of those that we do when you look at modern, modern day uh, neo-Nazism um, you know, they, they obviously have a great appreciation uh, for what, what Hitler and the Third Reich did. They, they try to model a lot of it. They try to use the same propaganda, the same recruitment and those sorts of things. But also, I think in their own heads, justify that what they're doing is completely different. Uh, and I think, you know, it, when, you, when you talk about, you know, those who are, who are looking to join the, the, join the armed, I'm sorry, join the, the police force and those sorts of things. Now, it's it's an interesting dichotomy because you see uh, there's no doubt that those people who hold the hateful ideology want to assume positions of power and, and are often drawn to the police department. Uh, but what you also see often is, is people who are easily manipulated, you know, people who you know, are, are looking for a sense of belonging and feel that they don't fit into society. You know, they are prime recruits for extremist movements. Uh, and then these extremist movements try to get their members placed in organizations like the police. Mm. Uh, so you have this perpetual cycle that's that's always moving. Mm. That that very is that's very likely what has happened because you know the the accountability is out of the window for police. I wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me if the movement had 
kind of pretty much gone to the top level of the uh, the police force where I live. Um, if you, we we don't have a commissioner. We have um, a chief constable. And if you told me that our chief constable was a neo-Nazi, it wouldn't really surprise me. Um, just you know how bad the local police has become and how low the standards have fallen. I mean. A lot, of, a lot of these officers that I meet tend to be very, you know, kind of naive and very, I don't want to say stupid, but they, they kind of just, it, it, it's really, really bad, the, bad, the standards uh, that you'll see within the police force. The IQ is just not very high, um, and that probably is what makes them so easy to kind of mold into, you know, that that organization as well. Um, so it, my next question is, uh, by the way, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I, th I think we've, we've reached an interesting period when you really see how recruitment and who is attractive to these extremist groups. As I said, you know, it, it's always fascinating to understand as one uh, is is one does one hold extremist ideology and then seek these positions, or do you seek these? Or, or does it happen in reverse? Mm. You know, I, I can tell you, at least in the United States, I don't know if the same is true in Great Britain, but you know, one of the most prized recruits uh, for these extremist movements tend to be military personnel. It tends to be veterans who have recently been discharged, mm. because you know, there you've got you know, you've got individuals who have very proudly serve their country, you know, here in the United States, there, uh, there, there are a lot of a battery of exams and things one has to get through, including uh, how well they did in school, obviously physical fitness and those sorts of things in order to serve their country. Uh, but when they come back, you know, they, when they come back, particularly now that they've all come back from Afghanistan, uh, they become prime targets for recruitment. Because they come back to a country that they feel doesn't understand them. They come back to a country they've been, they've been fighting and sacrificing for um, that uh, does not welcome them back the way they sometimes feel they deserve. And these extremist groups know that. Uh, and they will target these individuals for those very reasons uh, and realize that if you are a former military personnel, you come with a skill set that the average recruit does not have in terms of your military training. Uh, and, you know, really prey on these individuals, do a great disservice to their service to our country and the things that they've fought for, hmm. uh, because they're, they're looking to, to serve their own purposes. These organizations don't care who they use and how they use them. Uh, and I, I, and I, I know that we have at least a tradition where people will come back from active duty in the military and join the police force. Uh, and I think that makes them, you know, doubly attractive to these organizations in terms of potential recruits. Hmm. I I think that there is that type of individual in UK policing as well. Um, some of the officers that I kind of worry about, like uh, on this on the street level, look like they have military sort of, um, and they kind of hold themselves in a very kind of like almost like they're part of the. The army almost, and um, we don't have fire as many firearms officers here. But um, the ones that do carry guns tend to have that sort of military kind of look about them, and they'll have all their tattoos on show, and um, to be also wearing the thin blue line badge, which <laughs> kind of brings that to the to the forefront. Um, but yeah, it, it wouldn't surprise me if if. Uh, the majority of them were disillusioned by their war experience and they brought that home and they don't feel, I don't know, they, maybe they, they're bringing with them some trauma. Um, I think that there probably is a lot of what is happening in the US in terms of the, the far right, um, um, you know, kind of um, infiltrating the police. Um, a lot of that would probably reflect does to over here, but probably in a in a bit less of an extreme way. Um. I'll say I think you you just use the perfect word, and that becomes trauma. I think you know whether you're coming back from military service or or you have other trauma, particularly in your childhood. 
you know, that is one of the commonalities we see across those who join these far right extremist groups. You know, many of them don't don't join up at first for the ideology. Um, you know, they're they're joining because they're seeking that sense of belonging. They're seeking for somebody to finally understand them. And so many of these individuals come with trauma in their backgrounds, and they believe this is somehow going to help them instead of making it worse. Yeah. Um. So in UK policing, there is a term called the blue wall of silence. Uh, is this mm-hmm. something that? that exists in the u.s that term very much so very much so the blue the blue wall is something that uh, that most particularly in our urban cities are, are all too familiar with yeah so over here it's uh, if one officer does something bad their follow-up officers will keep silent and not report them um to the higher ups or call them out in any way um could uh, and my question was going to be could this be attributed to uh, neo-Nazism in some way. Um, I, I think one one could probably try to draw a dotted line to it. I think what you really see, uh, you know, is, is you know the the blue wall was there. You you I think as a result of police forces feeling like they were being attacked within their own communities, mm. uh, that they felt they were they were targeting particular neighborhoods. They felt they were targeting particular races or ethnicities, uh, and this belief that. Uh, you know, police have to stand up for police because nobody else is willing to do it, uh, quite frankly. You know, here, you know, we still have, and you, know, you still hear people that will that will make allegations about the blue wall. Uh, but I think, at least with regard to how the police engage with communities, one of the things we've done to address that, you know, is, as you know, all of our police are in the streets armed, uh, with, with usually with, with semi-automatic handguns. Mm-hmm. Um and one of the ways that, that we've dealt with it as a society is you've seen a, a rather significant adoption of body cameras uh, so yeah. that police have, you know, these you know, little little cameras on their lapels so that when they are engaging, even if they're if they're doing uh, a significant arrest and those sorts of things, there's video. Uh, and, you know, some believe that that has helped check some of the behaviors uh, that police have exhibited in the past. Uh, you know, others worry that it limits their ability to enforce. Uh, but that's one of the ways that, that we've definitely dealt with it. It, it becomes, you know, you, you will always have cameras malfunctioning. Uh, <laughs> but when you look at, you know, some of the, you know, the recent events, as I said, you know, particularly several of the police actions that happened, you know, either during the George Floyd moment or soon after the George Floyd moment. Yeah. Uh, you know, so much of, of there you have police officers who have been taken to court, have been charged uh, in part because of the body camera footage. Yeah, the, those um, body cameras, they do exist uh, within UK policing. Um, they get abused quite a lot, the the whole body cam thing. Uh, for example, uh, UK police have to tell you that the body cam is on uh, due to data protection they from the the 200 or so officers that i've met with and they have never done that um they never tell you that the camera's recording and they should because um you you're allowed to uh, request the footage you know when you're being uh, spoken to by a police officer um but you know they they are very very careful of of what they decide to share with the public of them being filmed um, they will come out with excuses like, oh, the footage got corrupted or um, the footage that you requested doesn't exist or, you know, do you have the log number? They'll send you on like a, a really long sort of fetch quest and it will just drive you mad and by the, you know, and it, it, it feels like in the UK the people who should be keeping an eye on officers' behaviour aren't really um, on the public side. Um, they are doing their best to um, to kind of, you know, act on the officer's behalf, even if that means, you know, brushing under the rug some very horrific um, uh, misconduct. And uh, the, the, the types of, of things that, you know, suddenly the footage, you know, was corrupted. Um, there, there's a big um, 
case in my area where uh, a girl said that she was uh, gang assaulted, sec sexually gang assaulted by a group of police officers. She requested the footage of that assault and they suddenly said, oh, the, it, it, it become corrupted or something. And um, it's, it's very common for them to sort of play, you know, play that card and, you know, hide their own abuse. It feels like the system over here has become kind of pretty much um, compromised from top to bottom. And it is really scary. And usually these types of things... Um, uh, I know the police like to think of themselves as the thin blue line, the divide between chaos, but usually they're the trigger as well. And it only takes one, one stupid thing for them to do to it, for it to um, create civil unrest and rioting and looting, like with the George Floyd thing, for example. Um, it, it just takes one thing like that to, to you know, set off you know, massive amount of destruction and panic and disorder and I I think the last time we had that in the UK properly was in 2011 and I fear that you know the next time that something like that happens it could be the end of all of us um, because the police are not equipped to deal with rioting or looting or any of that sort of thing I think that um, they have made such kind of enemies of the public here that it it would be quite catastrophic if that were to ever happen here again. Um, yeah, yeah, and I think it's un it's un it's unfortunate. I mean, I think you have you know, you'll often have one bad actor who will all of a sudden define the entire sector, and I think you definitely see that. As I said, you know, I, I believe that the vast majority of law enforcement are, are doing it for the right reasons. Does that mean that there are those who are not? Absolutely. Mm. Um, and I think that, you know, whenever they do something, that tends to be uh, what what we will focus on uh, as a society. You know, it, it's, you know, when you talk about you know, the last major action being in 2011, you know, versus what's going on today, I think, you know, the one big difference uh, is we begin to look at, at what we as citizens are all able to do. I mean, you think about people in the streets now who are very mindful uh, of of what can happen and are very quick to use their cell phones and take video, uh, are very quick to go to social media to share experiences and name names. Mm. Uh, and, you know, with that, you know, that, that tells us, you know, sometimes if the system is not willing to enforce accountability, then the people the people can do what they can to do it. Yeah. In, in the UK, auditing has become a lot more... It, it feels a lot more necessary and it's becoming a lot more popular. For example, I didn't have... I didn't know what auditing was until September and as soon as I found out about it, I was like, hang on, I experienced this stuff daily so I, I'd get a lot of footage and I've only put up seven videos, uploaded seven videos to YouTube. I've gotten... I'd say a total of 50, 60,000 views altogether from seven videos. I've gotten 450 subscribers. And it, it feels like the people, um, maybe not just in the UK, but worldwide, are kind of very unhappy with uh, the police and, you know, want, want to kind of see... I don't know what, what is happening out there as well. And... Um, Maybe that that is that is a, a kind of an indicate indicator of that, you know, of how po yeah. how quickly I've, I've received popularity, you know, just from uploading a few videos. Well, I think it's you know it, it's one of those examples. I mean, we we all want to unfortunately want to fear the worst. Yeah, uh, and so it it doesn't have to be bad actions in our in our own communities. I mean, it can be. You know, something happens over here in the states, and all of a sudden, it's got people in Manchester con concerned. Yeah. Um, you know, we—it's th thanks to the internet, we can see news around the world, whether it's relevant to us or not. And it, you know, we we are often able to find stories that support our worldview and 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 substantiate what we're concerned about. Mm. Uh, and so that I mean, that that can be an incredibly powerful tool. 
Mm. Um, but it can also, I think, sometimes sometimes get people to worry about things when they don't have that concern. Um, it's, it's, I, I can only imagine sometimes how the rest of the world views the United States when you look at all of our uh, gun violence, uh, you know, you know whether, whether it be handguns or our love of, of assault weapons as, as people, um, and how that looks, and, you know, it, it's you know, how, how fearful you can be realizing that uh, it is probably unlikely that your neighbors are going to buy an AR-15 today. Uh, mm-hmm. I know, you know, living in, in a part of the United States where I live, that most of my neighbors are probably very, very well armed right now. Uh, which area of, of the states do you live? I live in the South. I live in South Carolina. Oh, okay. Uh, which was, for, for those that know their history, we were, we were the cradle of the Confederacy. Right. Uh, when, when the U.S. had its civil war. Yeah, I I know a teeny bit about that, but I'm not as as um, you know. I don't know that much about yeah. the civil war in America. Um, it's it, areas like the South and the United States. I mean, it really becomes a microcosm of what we're dealing with. I mean, you've got a, a, a an area of the country that tends to be more conservative, uh, both politically and socially, than the rest of the country. It tends to be more religious. Hmm. Um, it tends to to vote Republican, uh, but as a result, you also live. I, I live in a state that has far less tolerance than some of the areas that uh, that most are more familiar with in the United States. I mean, you're, you're talking about an area that's been grappling with racism for mm. centuries, yeah. and that was was really at the, at the heart of slavery during its height in the United States. You're talking about an area uh, that still is is very is relatively misogynistic. Uh, you're talking about an area that is largely anti-LGBTQ plus, uh, and so you know, as because of all of that, you know, here in the United States, I can tell you that every far-right extremist group is rooted in both anti-Semitism and misogyny, uh, and that means places places like the Deep South in the United States are are homes for violent extremism because it aligns with with a lot of that ideology. Would you say as it, it's as bad as it was, um, you know, in the um, 60s, for example, with the um, with Martin Luther King and all that type of stuff going on. Or is, is that are the days of that level of kind of um, extremism gone? It's more kind of subtle now. I, I think it's both. I think you, you do see there 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 is now a subtle level of racism that that you you have the individuals hold in large part because some of the racism can't be as overt as it once was. Mm. Um, I do think, I mean, you, you see far more violence um, by individual individuals. Uh, you know, if you look during you know, the civil rights era in the United States when Martin Luther King was, was doing what he was doing, you know, there you were able to see some of the, you know, the blatant racism on display by our, our, our local law enforcement and our state law enforcement. Mm. You don't see that as much. But you see average people that are willing to take it on themselves. And I think part of that is, you know, we've, we've decided that there is really no room for the middle anymore. Uh, you're either with us or against us. There's no room for compromise. There's no room for people who are going to moderate their views. Is you have to be one extreme or the other uh, in the United States. You see that in our elected officials. There used to be a time where you elected individuals from the far left. You elected individuals from the far right. And both of our two political parties uh, would have members who were deemed moderates, uh, that they could work across the aisle. They could find ways to collaborate. That era is gone. We don't have that anymore. No. Uh, it's and so that that makes it much harder, but also you know will lead us to the belief that sometimes that the only thing that's you, 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 a growing concern in the United States right now is we are headed toward another civil war. Yeah, uh, because there is no room for compromise. There is no room for common ground, uh, and that we're we're headed for that destruction, which which only makes it harder when you realize how well armed we are as a people. Mm. Yeah, it's it's sad times. It is sad times. It feels like the beginning of the, of the end in <laughs> all probably all over the, especially in in the Western world. I think it's just it just feels like everybody's turning on one another. There's no there's no reasoning. There's no um, compassion. I, I think is 
is the word I'm yeah. looking for. You, nobody wants to I, listen. I think, yeah. It's just yeah. no. Nobody definitely wants to listen. I mean, I think it, it's it's one of those interesting things uh, where you know, it, it's. I, I can see why people get more and more worried. Um, you know, I think we, and we, at the same time, I will say we are incredibly fortunate that most of these extremist groups don't trust each other, uh, and so you're never, you're never going to experience a time where they unite, and, and that that is something that that significantly frightens me. Uh, but you know, it's it's always it's always fascinating. I mean, you look at extremist groups today, particularly in the United States, but I think the same is true in Great Britain. Uh, and there, there is a flavor of hate for just about anybody. Hmm. Uh, you know, you can hate the black community, you can hate the Asian community, you can hate immigrants, you can hate undocumented immigrants, you can hate the government, you know, you can hate the LGBTQ community, you can hate Muslims, you can hate those from the Middle East. I mean, we find just about everybody that we want to blame for why we're not getting what we think we're entitled to. Hmm. Um, and yet you know, that incredibly frustrating but at the same time i'll realize that yeah i mean we, we've got all of these flavors of hate today but we're also less of a homogeneous community than we've ever been in our lifetimes uh, and so you know it, it's the question is you know when we look at violent extremism it's so much the voice of the minority uh, it's not representative of most of the people in our society it's just who gets the attention and that, that becomes the real puzzler. Uh, and, and I'll often be asked questions about this, you know, with, with everything that's happening and with what so many of these extremists do both within and, and outside of civil society, should we be paying attention to them? Are we only helping them? Or, you know, when, when, the, when the news media is reporting on things, you know, when you're posting uh, to YouTube on activities that are happening in the name of extremism, is that giving them what they want? Uh, and I think the problem is we have to we have to be more open about what's happening. We've got to show sunlight on this, because quite frankly, I, I want to believe in in my fellow men and women, and want to believe that if they start seeing some of the atrocities that are being done in the name of their people, uh, or in the name of their ideology, uh, that they they will realize that they they want to be part of a solution and not continue to be part of this problem. Hmm. Yeah, um, it's quite worrying because I, I feel that my suspicions have all but been kind of, um, clar you know, kind of confirmed at this point. And when you have that many people in the police who kind of give Nazism a free pass and they're not hold ac held accountable, you know, I've I've really tried my best to kind of speak to these people and say look what you're doing is wrong and they they won't accept it and they, they've lost that kind of little bit of hope that you know they can because I, what the argument that i've given to them is it's not just my home you're destroying it's your own home and you know it's it's trying to bring them back from that but it's like almost impossible because they they're surrounded by people who kind of make them feel powerful and make them feel um, like they belong and that what they're doing is right and it is really terrifying and um, yeah um, that that's when I feel a little bit uh, nihilistic about the future because it's like if if there's no way back for these people then we're we're at a loss here because they they're yeah. never gonna they're never gonna change their minds they're never going to treat people the way that they should be they're never gonna be able to integrate back with society and that is really really kind of is this is the police we're talking about they're the ones who kind of are supposed to help society and so far from what I'm seeing they just kind of throwing fire and um, you know it, it is very very. I, I can tell you, I mean, we, we, we work with those who are violent extremists each and every day. Yeah. Uh, and you know, have, I, I can tell you, you know, when we show them, we, we, we believe in what we call compassion with accountability. Uh, and when, you know, we look to these individuals to take accountability for their past actions, to acknowledge what they've done is wrong and, and to, quite frankly, to look to make amends. 
uh, when they're willing to do that, change is possible. Um, but uh, I think, you know, we, we've experienced, I think, the, the same thing that you're describing that you've experienced is often, you know, when you, uh, when you look to confront individuals, uh, you know, when you look to prove to them uh, that what they're doing is wrong, that their ideology is harmful, uh, that can often drive them deeper into the ideology. But it is incredibly challenging. How do you have a meaningful conversation about it? You know, where you're, you're, you're trying to be respectful of individuals uh, and, you know, having to have these discussions to understand why they think what they think uh, when what they think is so abhorrent to you. Uh, those are incredibly difficult conversations to have, but they're conversations that in order for, for us to be successful as an organization, we have to have each day. Uh, well, um, maybe I'm asking too big of a question here because you're not in my shoes, but what, what would you say yeah. to the UK police if, if you were in my shoes and you saw somebody who had very kind of questionable um you know, a, a very questionable outlook. How would you try and bring them back from that? Because I've tried to well, think, think of everything I can to, to yeah. reach out to these people, but it's never worked. It's always fallen on deaf ears. So. And, and I think, unfortunately, that, that tends to be the case, and, and you often have to just keep at it until you figure out a breakthrough. I think, you know, from my perspective, there, there are two, two ways you have to look at this. One is the individual. Mm. Uh, you know, how, how is it when you're looking at individual officers that you believe are, are guilty of this ideology? Uh, you know, how, how do you have conversations? How do you demonstrate, as, as you're trying to do already, uh, that their, their thoughts and their behaviors are detrimental to their, the communities that they're entrusted in serving uh, and, and are harmful to themselves and their families? I think it also, though, becomes an institutional issue. Uh, and uh, I think you, you, you raise some good points with regard to badges and those sorts of things. And you know, it really becomes a conversation to have with local law enforcement you know, in terms of understanding why this is tolerated. Where in their procedures is this allowed? Uh, you know, what recourse is there for individuals who feel that you know, simply, you know, the, the displays of such thoughts uh, are a threat to them. Um, you know, that, you know, I think you're talking about trying to do two things here. One is how do you change it institutionally so that uh, local law enforcement is not uh, as accepting as, as you're describing, but then really getting it at the individual level. Uh, you know, how do you demonstrate for those, particularly those who uh, their actions have, you know, they, they've not physically manifested their ideology into harm against others. Uh, how do you help them see that there there all are there are alternative paths? You know, particularly with law enforcement. You know, how do you help them understand that if they hold a harmful ideology and if they should act on that ideology, uh, that disrespects them and disrespects the very uniform that they wear? Yeah, I, as I said before, I think that the the, the accountability comes from the top, but. The, the person at the top, our chief constable, he is essentially a politician playing a police officer, and that is that is probably the 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 big issue with the institution of policing is the people at the top um, themselves aren't held accountable, and um, <laughs> you know what 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 can we do? It's just um, and. Yeah, these these people have this unlimited power, and they're not held accountable. Accountable, and it's um, a lot of the auditors in the UK describe it as tyranny, and a lot of the police here come across as tyrants because they're not held accountable, and they do, they see the public as like beneath them or like subhumans. So it's 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 impossible, I think. Um, to, to change them just by yeah. speaking to them, unfortunately. It is, and I think I, you've, you've, you've really laid into something that becomes so important, and that is you know, the, this, this tolerance, you know, the, this tolerance of extremism is often the result of tolerance coming from the top. Mm. Uh, it, 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 it's, hard, it's hard for you to be accountable as an individual 
Uh, if those that are in charge, you know, whether you're talking about your workplace, whether you're talking about your church, whether you're talking about your community, or even a former extremist group, uh, formal extremist group, rather, you know, as long as that is being tolerated, it's hard for you to say this is wrong. It's hard to try to change behaviors if that's a culture that you're, you're living in. Uh, and you know, I think that, again, the, the more sunshine we place on these issues, you know, the more we talk about uh, the, the damage this can cause, the damage it has caused, uh, and how we as communities really can't continue to stand for it. That's the only way you begin to make that sort of change. I wish it happened overnight. It doesn't. Uh, these sorts of changes uh, can, can take you know, generations sometimes, and we, we have to be patient uh, while also being impatient and realizing that these are things we just can't tolerate. Mm. Um, so the next question I had was, I've witnessed a lot of brutality towards minors, homeless, and minor minorities in my area. Uh, the excessive use of police powers in broad daylight makes me feel that British police utilize such tactics. Um, and these are the ones I've, I fear that, that have been um, compromised by neo-Nazism. I, I fear that they are using sort of excessive uh, force against targeted groups in order to... Um, send like a subliminal message of fear and panic in the public um, mm -hmm. is this a tactic that you recognize within extremist organizations i mean I, I think when you look within extremist groups there is no question um that all of these groups trade in bullying in fear in intimidation and in gaslighting absolutely hmm. um and I, and I think you know, when, when you look at what you're describing in law enforcement, I think it becomes one of those important facts you know, to realize that you do have some law enforcement that are, are going to take a hard line because they see that they're, part of their job is making sure that they're providing a safe community for the taxpayers. Uh, and these sorts of shows of force uh, become important. Um, but uh, I think you know, there, there is no doubt that you see you know, fear. Fear and intimidation is a key tool uh, of violent extremist groups in this, in this world. Mm. Um, yeah, th that that argument of you know we pay for the police, so they they are essentially public servants that work for the public. That argument has been brought to them so many times, and yeah. every time they like. They just don't. They don't care. They don't um, see themselves as public servants. They see themselves as kind of like a, an authoritarian figure, who um, who don't answer to anybody and who are there to ask questions um, and not answer them. And um, yeah, it, it is just very, very um, cyclical and. Um, I'm 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 not sure that a lot of them even understand what their job is, because um, uh, you'd imagine that becoming a police officer is it's, it's more of a calling. It should be you know to protect and serve. It's not it's not just a job that you. It's not like you like being a cashier is just a job to pay the bills. You know you go home you don't feel passionate about it. Like, it's very hard work being. <laughs> <laughs> being a police officer, so it should be a calling, but the the people who a hundred percent of them treat it like it's a job and not something that they feel passionate about in any way and want to do a good job in any way as either. And that's that's the thing. It, it is such a complex job, particularly today. Mm. Uh, you know, when, when you realize you know, the, the, the level, you know, in order to do it well, at least, uh, you know, the amount of, of cultural competency that's required, the amount of understanding, the amount of de-escalation, um, you know, I think no matter where you live, you know, at the end of the day, we as society, you know, we're, we're looking to police officers, not only as law enforcement, uh, but we're looking them. We're looking to them as social workers. We're looking to them as mediators. We're you know all sorts of other jobs we seem to be putting on them because they're there. They're the first line of defense. Um, and you know, I, I can see how draining that can be, uh, and how those who are well-meaning in those positions may choose to leave. 
Uh, and then as, as you're describing then, you know, how in order to fill those positions, you're having to, uh, to turn to individuals who may not be the ideal candidates, uh, but are at least filling those jobs. Uh, and it, it just, it becomes incredibly challenging to see how we address problems like that. Yeah. Um, a few years ago, there was about 20,000 officers. I don't know if that's a big number in the US, but in the UK, that was a massive amount of officers to suddenly just lay off. And then the police that were left were extremely uh, overworked and stressed out. And a lot of those decided to leave. And with all of those police officers went experience and actual passion for the job and this was in about 2016 and um, I spoke to a rabbi recently about this whole thin blue line neo-nazi theory that I have and he was one of the people that was sitting on the board of of um, of I think he was vetting like, like a sort of review board of the for the police you know in terms of uh, with local um, faiths and, and groups and he said that it was he decided to leave that role because he felt that it, it the police was at an end because it was like you've lost 20,000 officers suddenly the government turned around and say actually that was a really bad idea let's hire 20,000 20, more people to take those roles getting those roles filled by the correct people would, was an impossible task he said so they ended up just letting people in um, just to get those numbers met and suddenly the government was like hey look we've we fixed the problem that we caused <laughs> and um, now we we have all sorts of really scary people um, with uh, with police badges and um, you know I don't know whether the horror stories uh, you know come to the US from here but there was a, a chap called uh, Wayne Cousins and he was he um he was one of the really bad types who kind of was given this uh police role and he abused his powers to uh kidnap a young girl and um unfortunately murder her and do everything to her under the sun and it was just like that type of thing is unfortunately becoming more and more common and it's like the the mainstream media in the UK will like um, want to talk about it because the police and mainstream UK media have a very close relationship and they're kind of almost like a propaganda for for the for the the police and um, and the government. It's all kind of like a big sort of institution, and YouTube is the only way that that you can actually get your voice heard and it's it's very scary i forgot what what, what were we talking about? what what started this um train of thought again oh it was just it was, it was, it was the notion of how how police officers or, or constables are treating their their positions yeah uh, yeah so uh, i i think i'll just ask my last question because we've pretty much yeah. covered because I understand it's very awkward because I'm in England, you're in the US. The police are different, but they're quite similar in a lot of ways. Um, and, um, yeah, so the last question I have is if my suspicions are correct and UK police have become compromised by neo-Nazi neo Nazism, is there a message you would like to send to the people who hold these extremist views well I, th I think at the end of the day um, there is no room for a violent extremist ideology in law enforcement or in any government service for that matter uh, and you know we may have tolerated it in the past but I think as we recognize that, that these ideologies are becoming greater and greater threats uh, that we have to continue to put sunshine on the concerns uh, we have to call out when there are problems uh, and that, you know, we, we have an obligation to our society to do so. Um, you know, it is, it is a shame to see uh, that these individuals uh, who 
embrace a, a neo-Nazi mentality, embrace a white supremacist mentality, uh, are, are in positions of authority. Uh, and it is an even greater disgrace that they dishonor those who are in law enforcement or in government service and are doing it for the right reasons. Um, you know, it's, it, 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 is, it is a growing concern when you see these organizations trying to put their ideologues in positions of power. Uh, because we're talking about organizations like law enforcement, like the military, like the government, uh, that we all should trust and rely on. Uh, and all you need is one bad actor uh, that makes it so that we can't trust the entire field. Uh, and that's that's not good for anybody. And I think we, we all have an obligation, particularly those of us uh, who may not be subjected to some of the, of the, the bullying or the fear intimidation uh, that, uh, that we often hear about. Uh, you know, we have to not only be supporters uh, for our fellow men and women, but we have to be co-conspirators. Uh, we have to recognize that change is something that requires uh, work from all of us, not just from those of us who may be the victims. Hmm. Um, there's, a, there's a few more questions that I sort of suddenly have um so you know that the, these um ex neo nazis do they come to you or do they do you find them um are they uh, are they incarcerated when you find them how do you come across these people sure uh, it's it's a, ra a ra range of, of avenues uh, we have some that will reach out to us directly yeah. uh, they will they, they will realize that their life has hit rock bottom and they need to make change uh, there are some that will reach out to us because their ideology is beginning to soften, largely because they realize so much of what they've been advocating for, they're starting to, to recognize that it's simply not true. Uh, mm -hmm. We will have some that come to us because a family member or a loved one has reached out to us wanting help. Uh, right. uh, is that the majority of them, the, the, the loved yeah. ones? Uh, but uh, we, we are also now, you know, we do a, a fair amount of work uh, within... Um, the justice system. Uh, and so we will have individuals that will begin to work with us in, as part of their terms to avoid prison. Uh, we have individuals that will work with us in terms of uh, required as part of their terms of parole. Uh, and we do work with individuals who are currently incarcerated. Uh, and those are probably the, the hardest individuals to work with uh, because not, not because they're not committed to the process, uh, but because for many of them, the, the hate ideology that they might have held is the only thing that's keeping them alive while they're incarcerated. Because hmm. there's for, like a gang. All the sort of. to disengage. Yeah. Um, uh, what was I going to ask again? Um, so it, it usually is like the and like a really sort of extreme thing that ha that brings them to the to you isn't it it's like either their family thinks that there's there's going to be or a loved one thinks that there's going to be something catastrophic that's going to happen to them as a result of their their beliefs or you know they have reached a point of just complete and utter you know sort of burn burning out or something um yeah a loved one will be worried, you know, particularly when they see events that happen either here in the United States or around the world, and, and they fear that somebody they care about could get caught up in the next uh, next version of that. Um, you know, you have those that you know, their their wife, their girlfriend, their significant other may be threatening to leave, and uh, you know, this is the only the only way they may be able to keep them, or even worse, they may be talking about taking their children away. Uh, you know, you'll have individuals who are finding it impossible to find a job or find a place to live because of their ideology. Uh, and so they'll begin to sort through that. I mean, so much of this, as I said, so much of, of what we deal with is rooted in trauma. Uh, you know, so much of what we deal with not only requires the sorts of services that we provide, but it requires uh, the services of licensed mental health professionals. Uh, which you know are often not part of this equation, are not a population that many extremists trust at the moment, uh, and so there's there's a need to build those relationships as well because it's all part of successfully exiting violent hate. 
Mm. I, I would say that a lot of the these officers that I meet with have very severe mental health uh, impairments. Unfortunately, the mental health system in the UK is uh, non-existent. <laughs> the government is not helping with that at all, and they've pretty much turned the mental health sector into ashes and if you end up with even a small like a very mild sort of depression chances are you're doomed <laughs> um uh because it will get worse and the stresses will make it worse and um i can imagine that some of them some of the the people that i've met with or you know um assume have have very extremist um, ideologies probably have very severe uh, mental health problems but there's no help out there that exists and it's it's just everybody's everywhere is just suffering <laughs> um, um, I think that's it but I, I don't know if uh, if I have another question can I just email it to you or um, sure. yeah um uh, thank you very much, Patrick. It's been very, very enlightening, and you've given me quite a lot to to use for my upcoming video. I will le I'll let you know when it's uploaded. But these the editing of these things it just takes me weeks because I just work by myself. And um, oh, of course, yeah. But I, I try my best with all of my videos. Um, it's Ray K Audits. If I didn't tell you it you before, my YouTube channel is Ray K Audits. And uh, you'll see some of the, the the interactions that I've had with uh, the police and um, within my uh, area. So what I'm going to be doing with this interview is putting it together with the 20 or so uh, filmed uh, interactions that I've had with officers who have defended the Thin Blue Line. And you'll see the, the level of coldness within the, <laughs> within the UK police. Um, and their responses. I mean, from that video that you saw that I of the link that I sent, um, that's the level of kind of ambivalence UK police have towards you know Nazism. But some of the responses I've got went even were even uh, they were just very scary, very very scary, like so sociopathic. <laughs> um, in nature when I for example I met a sergeant I said to him um, you know there may be Jewish people watching this what do you feel um, how what would you like to say to them when they see that you're defending the thin blue line badge and he just had nothing to say he just coldness emptiness and um, but I, I won't spoil any more for you <laughs> okay I look forward to seeing it yeah, okay then. Thank you very much, Patrick. You're welcome. I'll talk to you soon, Ray. Thank you. Bye.